we now have every bits and pieces to formally define some product decoder for LEPC codes, which is the main decoder. Really the main decoder that is used in most of the applications. And uh, there are a lot of variants of this decoder and we'll see some simplifications and variants later on. But first we describe the main basic decoder. So first we need a little bit of notation to have a compact definition of the decoder. And uh, therefore we introduce the so-called connection set or the neighbor sets of variable order and check -mate. So we start with an LDPC code with a parity check matrix H of size M times N. And we denote the neighborhood of a variable node VI or the connection set of a variable node VI, the check node numbers of the check node that are connected to this variable node. Looks complicated. We're going to see it in the example. It's very simple. So the neighborhood of variable node VI is essentially all the rows of the parity check matrix J such that HJI is equal to one. And then we do the same thing for the check nodes. Neighborhood or connection set of a check node CJ is the variable node numbers that are connected to the check node. Essentially, M of check node CJ is the set of I's, where I defines the columns of the parity check matrix, such that HJI is equal to one. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's take a look at an example. So our usual example, the seven for hemming code, we have the variable node connection sets, N1, variable node X1 is connected to three check nodes, C1, C2, and C3. So the connection sets is one, two, and three, because it's connected to C1, C2, and C3. Variable node X2 is connected to C1 and C2, so the connection set is equal to one and two. Then X3 is connected to C1 and C3, so the connection set is one and three. X4 is connected to C2 and C3, so it's two and three, and so on. So connection set seven is just connected to C3, so it's a single entry one. And the same thing works for the check nodes. So if you look at check node C2, for instance, C2 is connected to X1, X2, X4, and X6. So the connection set is one, two, four, and six. So that's just a way of defining the connection or an alternative representation of the graph by using so-called neighborhoods of the graph. This will simplify the decoder quite a bit. So we now denote the, the messages that we pass in the decoder. We need some notations. The messages that we pass are log likelihood ratios, as you can maybe infer from what we have derived before. And we use the following notations. So we have two kinds of messages. We have messages that are computed by the variable nodes and passed to the check nodes. So we call them L, V, and then we use a subscript I to J. So it's a message that is computed by variable node VI and going towards check node CJ. So the superscript V determines the source of the message. So it determines that it's computed by a variable node V and it determines that it's going towards a check node CJ. And this is the direction of the tenor graph. So variable nodes on the left of the tenor graph, check nodes on the right, and the messages go from left to right. Similar way we define the check to variable node messages. We have LC from J to I. That's the, the message computed by check node CJ and going to verb node VI. So it's calculated um, 
check note CJ, and it's going from check note J towards variable note BI. Okay, so that's essentially it. That's the definition of the, the name of the messages. So we have a superscript that denotes where the information is coming from and the direction of the arrow determines the direction of the message flows. So some examples. So here, um, before the examples, we denote also the channel transition log likelihood ratios by L tilde. So the one that corresponds to variable node VI is L of YI given XI, that is equal to L tilde of I. So here's an example. We have L tilde of I connected to variable node VI. Then we have message coming from check node CK towards variable node VI. We have message coming from check node CJ towards variable node VI. And we have message from variable node VI towards check node CJ, that's L, I, J, V. Okay, that's the one example, here's another example. So here we have two variable nodes, BK, BI. Again, channel transition log, likelihood ratios L tilde K. And we have the different messages, go from check node, a uh, variable node BK to check node CJ, go from check node CJ to variable node BI, and go from variable node VI to check node CJ. So this is how we can describe the messages. So it's a little lot of superscript and upscript. It's a little bit redundant because of this V and the direction of the arrows, but um, making it redundant hopefully simp helps um, quickly seeing and identifying what is the type of messages. This is the decoding algorithm. Here we have it, and it fits on one slide. I don't even need to change the size. It's a little bit cramped, but that's the decoding algorithm. So um, let's go through the decoding algorithm um, and see what's, what's going on. So the decoding algorithm starts as follows. So we have the initialization step. So what do we start with? The only thing we have at the beginning is the channel transition log likelihood ratios, L tilde of i, so L of yi given xi for every variable node. So in the first step, we set L V I to J to be equal to L I tilde. That's it. So this is the variable node message towards the check note messages. So we have the first variable to check note messages. The variable node, they all send a message towards their check notes. Now we can calculate the check note messages. So we go over every possible check node in our tenor graph and check notes. And for every connected edge, we calculate an outgoing message. So for every i in the neighborhood of this check node CJ, we calculate the message going from i from check node J to variable node i. And we know how to calculate the messages of the check nodes. It's the hyperbolic tangent function. And we need to take the product over all incoming messages, except the one where we are sending it to. So we take the messages from the neighborhood, I prime equals from the neighborhood MJ, except the message that we're sending towards, which is we're sending towards variable node VI. So we exclude the message that coming from variable node VI. So this is the backslash operator is the set difference, so we exclude the message. And then we calculate the hyperbolic tangent of those incoming messages divided by two, take the product, and then calculate two times inverse hyperbolic tangent. So now we have calculated for every check node, we have calculated messages that go towards the variable nodes. Now we do the same for the variable nodes. So we have messages coming from the check nodes, we have channel transition log likelihood ratio, so now we can update the variable nodes. So what we do is for every variable node VI, we calculate outgoing messages for every connected edge. So again, we go for every element in the neighborhood of the messages, and then 
we calculate the outgoing message as we have seen it just in the previous video. So we have L tilde I, the channel transition log likelihood ratio, plus the sum over the incoming messages from the check notes. But again, we exclude the message from the check note for which we are computing a message. So we are computing a message that we want to send to check note CJ. So we take the messages coming from the check note, except the one coming from check note CJ. This is the one we exclude. And then we just sum up the messages. You can already see why the decoder is called sum product decoder, because essentially we'd have two operations, this big summation and this product. That's why it's called sum product decoder. So after these two steps, we can now make a decision. So for every variable node, we calculate the total log likelihood ratio, the a posteriori log likelihood ratio, it's called total, because we sum up over everything we have. It's a repetition code, so we want to make a decision of a repetition code. So we sum up the channel transition log likelihood ratio and all the messages coming from the connected check nodes. And if this total log likelihood ratio is negative, we decide for one. If it's positive, we decide for a zero, etc. So now we can make a code word, we can make a decision x hat, and we check if x hat is actually a code word. So if h times x hat is equal to zero, we are done. We can decide, we can take x hat, we are done. And otherwise, if we are not done, we jump back to step two. And we just repeat step two, step three, and checking if we have a code word until we have actually found a code word, or until we have reach the maximum budget of iterations. So this is one iteration. And we just repeat this step over and over again until we have exhausted our budget of iterations that we'd like to do or until we have actually found a code word. That's the sum product decoding algorithm. So the sum product decoding algorithm actually minimizes the bitwise a posteriori probability so it minimizes the bitwise a posteriori probability p of x i given y. This is the bitwise map decoder under some assumptions. Under the assumptions that the bits of the code word are independent, which may not be entirely the case, but this is the assumption that we do. And under the second assumption that the messages that are sent are independent, this is equivalent to saying that we have a tenor graph without cycles. So if we have a tenor graph without cycles, if the code bits x i independent, then this sum product decoder algorithm is equivalent to the bitwise map decoder. And we have a formal derivation if you go to the extra material section. So in the extra material, there is a formal derivation of this decoder, and um, then you can find, if you like, the details and the derivation. Here in the lecture, uh, we just do the hand-waving arguments, uh, but you can formally derive it starting from this expression, by expanding this expression, by adding the simplifications, you will end up with this sum product decoder. Now, unfortunately, these assumptions are not practical. So we cannot meet those assumptions in practice uh, because all the practical codes, they essentially have cycles in their graph. So it's not possible to have a code without cycles in the graph that is practically relevant. And we're going to see this later in Ethereum. And um, so therefore, it's not actually carrying out bitwise map decoding but it's getting, uh, it has a pretty good performance in practice. So we have a very, very good decoder in practice, and um, we're going to see some decoding results. So here is an example. Um, I constructed a few codes. So I constructed a first code, regular LDPC code with verbal node degree three, 
check note degree 15. And the second one is variable note degree 4 and check note degree 20. Both of these codes have a rate of 4 over 5. And the length of the code I constructed was 38,400. Take this number for given that's something that is uh, practically used, for instance, in uh, video broadcasting. This is a typical length of an LDPC code. And we carry out 30 iterations. So what we see here is the bit error rate after decoding, it's called post RVC, post forward error correction bit error rate as a function of EB over N0. And the green curves, they are the curves for EB equals 4, DC equals 20. And we see that after one iteration, we have a pretty high bit error rate that only drops very slowly. But if we increase the number of possible iterations that we can do up to 30 iterations, then we have almost a step function. So we have a very rapid decrease in the bit error rate if we increase EB over N0. And if we spend more than 30 iterations, not so much will actually change. So um, how does this depend on the parameters of the code? Now, if I choose different parameters like 3 and 15, then I actually even get a better performance. So there is some dependency on the parameters on the performance. So this code with parameters db3, dc15 has a better performance than the code with db equals 4 and dc equals 20. The difference is small. It's less than 0.1 dB. Very small difference, but it's there. And in the next uh, chapter, we're going to see where this difference comes from and how to explain this difference. All right, so that's this uh, first example. So if we want to look at where this code sits in the specular efficiency chart, um, then we're looking at a target bit error rate of 10 to the power minus 6. So let's go back again. 10 to the power minus 6, we are sitting here. We have an EB over N0 of 2.8 dB. So let's take a look. Here in the plot, um, so we have a rate of 4 over 5. The rate of the code is 4 over 5, which is 0 0.8. We're sitting at a rate of 0 0.8, and we are at an EB of N0 of 2.8 dB. And we can see that we are already extremely close to the capacity. So there is only like 1 dB difference to the capacity and we outperform both the repetition codes, which we know are not very good, but also the having codes, which we know are also not very good. So we outperform them by large. And also, um, if we plot them as a function of ES over N0, we also see that there is a, uh, the same difference and uh, we are very close to the capacity of the binary input AWGN channel. Very good codes, a very good performance. Um, looks looks great. Here is another example we applied on the binary symmetric channel. Now, this is interesting because the decoder is channel agnostic. The decoder that we presented does not depend on the channel. The only thing it needs is log likelihood ratios. So if we can calculate log likelihood ratios for a channel, we can use this decoder. This decoder here just gets log likelihood ratios. It's completely channel agnostic. You don't care what the channel is. You just care that you can calculate log likelihood ratio. And that is also why this um, decoder is very, very popular. It is simple. It is just some small calculations. It is um, channel agnostic. So you just need to have log likelihood ratio and you can apply to any channel, the same decoder. So you need to implement it once and use it for whatever you can use it for. So for binary symmetric channel, you just recall, we calculate the L of uh, Y given X is equal to minus one to 
power y times ln of 1 minus delta divided by delta. And that's your L tilde of y. And then you plug this into the decoder and you let it run. So here we have a code of rate 1 half. We have a 3, 6 LDPC code. N equals 20,000. K equals 10,000. That's the image of 100 times 100 pixels. And the rate is 1 half. So we have the information bits over here and the parity bits that are below. They are just rearranged that we can see the comic. And we have a binary symmetric channel with 7.5% bit error rate. We can see that there are frequent errors. And now we let the decoder run. So one iteration, not so much has happened. Two iterations after three iterations, you can see that the number of errors has uh, reduced. Here you can see some sections have cleared up a little bit. So uh, let's let it run a little bit further. So after 11 iterations, we have just a few tiny errors left. After 12 iterations, one, two errors here that we can notice. And after 13 iterations, we are essentially error free. So we can recover the image without errors using this code. With this very same decoder as for the AW Gen channel, for the BSC, we can recover this image perfectly. So if you look at this decoding behavior, there is something a little bit nasty that we didn't see because before we cut off the bit array at 10 to the power minus six. So the decoding behavior of LDPC codes can be um, divided into three regions. We have the region where the bit array is very large and essentially not so much happens when we increase the signal to noise ratio, the EB of N0. Then there is a parameter that is called the threshold. So this threshold, if we move beyond this threshold, the bit error rate starts to decrease very rapidly. And it starts to decrease very, very rapidly. And then there is an effect that is called an error flaw. So the error flaw then, the slope of the bit error rate curve changes dramatically and we move into this error flow. And in the error flow, the bit error rate curve changes very, very slowly. Off. It will still decrease, it will not stay flat, it will still decrease, but it will decrease very, very slowly. And this is a disadvantage. This is why we have not um, played the game to the end of channel coding. This is why there is still work to be done. Because if you have applications like a hard drive, when you want very low bit error rates, you don't want a single bit to be corrupted in a storage device. You cannot tolerate this behavior. By no means can this behavior be tolerated because this means that uh, if you have an error rate of 10 to the power minus 12, it means that uh, if you have 1000 gigabit, so a terabit, which is not so much, um, hard, common hard drive, they have terabytes of storage, there is on average one error. You don't want an error in one terabyte. And you don't even want, if you have hardware with, uh, let's say, two terabytes, then you have roughly 20 terabits, then on average you have 20 errors. That's something you, um, you don't want. So uh, we need different codes. This is an effect of LDPC code that depends on the decoding algorithm. So it has Two, um, the two main reasons. One of the reasons is the cycles in the graph. They prevent the decoding algorithm to get stuck for some error patterns. Or you have a minimum distance that is not too low. That is another issue. But, um, we'll not deal for the time being with the error flaw for communication applications. This is usually perfectly tolerable or you can push it usually to the range where you are not so much interested in the error flow. So uh, let's take a look at this threshold. So the threshold is essentially the channel parameter at which the bit error rate starts to drop very rapidly. 
And uh, we can actually see that we can compute this threshold and that it depends on the code parameters. We'll compute this threshold in the next chapter and uh, then you can see how we can, um, yeah, how, it, um, how this uh, threshold can be actually evaluated and calculated. The goal of the code design is to move this threshold because you can numerically calculate it you can use it to optimize the parameters of the code. The goal of the code design is to move this threshold as close to capacity as possible, because that will push this uh, part where the curve starts to drop as close to capacity as possible. So here I show some uh, thresholds and compare them with the capacity of a few codes. So first we're going to look at some codes of great uh, one half. So these are all codes of rate one half. We have first the regular codes, which is three and six, and it has a threshold of 1.1 dB. And the capacity of rate one half codes is 0 0.187 dB in dB over naught. There is like 0 0.9 dB roughly difference here. We calculate the threshold for the 4.8 code. We see that it is significantly worse with 1.6 compared to 1.1, so it's 0 0.5 dB worse. And this is 1.5 dB away from capacity, so this is not such a good code. Then we can um, heavily optimize codes, and this is an example of what can be done using a class of codes that is called irregular codes, which we're going to see later. And for this class of codes, we can push the threshold to be 0 0.192 dB, which when we compare this to 0 0.187 dB, there is, um, this is pretty, pretty close. So this is 0 0.0045 dB difference between the two codes. So you can actually push it very, very closely. But for this code, in order to um, explore the, the potential need very, very large lengths of the code, so n needs to be 10 million bits, and the error flaw also for this code is pretty large. So let's take the two, take a look at the two codes of rate four over five from the previous simulation. We can also calculate the threshold. Um, we already saw there was a difference in the performance, and we see that the threshold is 0 0.58 for the 315 code and 2.67 for the rate four over 20 code. And we see that this difference more or less corresponds to the difference in the bit error rate that we saw. Capacity is 2 dB, so um, we are 0 0.56 dB away from capacity. So let's take a look at this threshold and see if we can um, copy this, if we can insert this also in the picture of our simulation result that is here. So I'm just going to put this slide, these values up here. So these are the thresholds that we have. And we can insert the thresholds. So for the 315 codes, we have 2.586. That's 2.586. That's somewhere over here. That's for the 315. And for the 420 code, it's 2.67. So that's somewhere over here. And this is the 420 code. So we can see that the threshold more or less predicts the behavior of the code. So we can see that from these thresholds on, um, the curves start to drop. Um, so here the, this is the threshold, the curve starts to drop. There is a gap between the threshold and the curve, and this is because of finite length effects. Uh, ideal decoder and a code that has a very asymptotically long length will have a performance that is exactly on the threshold. And um, we see this difference predicts more or less also the difference between this two curves. So that's the threshold, more on the threshold and 
next chapter where we're going to see how to calculate these thresholds in detail. So a few words on the error floor. The error floor is um, a very fuzzy definition, but we say we have an error floor if above a certain EB over and zero, the bit error rate does not decrease rapidly anymore, but decreases just with a small slope. So uh, in, the four, uh, in the previous example, if EB of N0 is above 4.5 dB, the bit error rate decreases by 100, by factor 100 per decibel only, and before we had a decrease of 100 per 0 0.1 decibel more. As I said, this limits the application of LDPC codes to applications where you can tolerate such an uh, bit error, such an error flaw. Where is the error flow coming from? Essentially, it's a combination of cycles and a combination of error patterns that cause the decoder to, have to get stuck. And it's still an active area of research to find LDPC codes that have very low error. All right, so far we have introduced the sum product decoder. Now we need to simplify the sum product decoder because this hyperbolic tangent operation is a very nasty operation that cannot be easily implemented. That's what we're going to see in the next video.